Varney the Vampire or the Feast of Blood by Thomas Prescott Prest. Produced by Charles Franks, Deborah Stores and Brown, and PG Online Distributor Proof Reading Team. The unprecedented success of the romance of Varney the Vampire gives the author but little to say further. That he accepts the success and it results as greatly as it possible for anyone to do popular favors. A belief in the existence of vampires first took a rise in Norway and Sweden, from whence it rapidly spread to more southern regions taking a firm hold of the imaginations of the more credulous portions of mankind. The following romance is collected from seemingly the most authentic sources, and the authors must leave the question of credibility entirely to his readers, not even thinking that he is particularly called upon to express his own opinion upon the subject. Nothing has been omitted in the life of the unhappy Varney, which could tend to throw a light upon his most extraordinary career, and the fact of his death, just as it is here related, made a great noise at the time to Europe, and is to be found in the public print for the year 1713. With these few observations, the author and publisher are well content to leave the work in the hands of a public, which has stamped it with an approbation far exceeding their most sanguine expectations and which is calculated to act as the strongest possible incentive to the production of other works, which in a like, or perchance a still further degree, may be deserving of public patronage and support. To the whole of the Metropolitan Press for their long term notice, the author is perfectly obliged. Varney the Vampire, or the Feast of Blood, a romance. Chapter 1. How graves give up their dead, and how the night air he disgrows with streets. Midnight, the hailstorm, the dreadful visitor, the vampire. The solemn tone of old Catrice O'Clock have announced midnight. There is thick and heavy, a strange death like stillness pervades our nature. Like the ominous calms which betrays so more than usually terrific outbreak of the elements. They seem to have paused, even in their ordinary fluctuations, to gather a terrific strength for the great effort. A faint peal of thunder now comes from far off, like a signal gun for the battle of the winds to begin. It appeared to awaken them from their lethargy, and one awful warring hurricane swept over a whole city, producing more devastation in the four or five minutes it lasted. Then, with the half century, Ordinary phenomena. It was as if some giant had blown upon some quiet town and scattered many of the buildings before the hot blast of his terrific breath. For as suddenly as the blast of him had come, did it cease, and all was as still and calm as before. Sleepers awakened and thought that what they had heard must be the confused chimera of a dream. They tremble and turn to sleep again. Always still, still as the very grave. Not a sound breaks, the magic response. What is that? A strange, pattering noise, as of a million of fairy feet. It is hail. Yes, a hail storm has burst over the city. Leaves are dashed from the trees, mingle small boats, windows that lie most opposed to the direct fury of the pelting particles of ice are broken and the rapt response that before was so remarkable in its intensity is exchanged for a noise which in its accumulation drowns every cry of surprise or consternation, which here and there arose from persons who found their houses invaded by the storm. Now and then, too, there would come a sudden gust of wind that in its strength, as it blew laterally, would for a moment hold millions of the hailstones suspended in midair, but it was only to dash them with redoubled force in some new direction where more mischief 
was to be done. Oh, how the storm raged. Hail, rain, wind. It was in very truth an awful night. There is an antique chamber in an ancient house. Curious and quaint carvings adorn the walls, and the large chimney piece is a curiosity of itself. The ceiling is low, and a large bay window from roof to floor looks to the west. The window is latticed and filled with curiously painted glass and rich stained pieces, which send it a strange yet beautiful light when sun or moon shines into the apartment. There is but one portrait in that room, although the walls seem paneled for the express persons containing a series of pictures, that portrait is of a young man, with a pale face, a stately brow, and a strange expression about the eyes, which no one cared to look on twice. There is a stately bed in that chamber, of carved walnut wood in its made, rich in design and elaborate in execution. One of those works of art which owe their existence to the Elizabethan era, it is hung with heavy silken and damask furnishings. Not jean feathers are at its corners, covered with dust, are draped, and in made a funeral, funereal aspect to the room. The floor is of polished oak. God, how the hail dashes on the old bay window, like an occasional discharge of mimic musketry. It comes clashing, beating, and cracking upon the small panels, but they resist it. Their small sizes save them. The wind, the hail, the rain, expands their fury in vain. The bed that old chamber is occupied. A creature formed in all fashions of loveliness lies in a half sleep upon that ancient couch. A girl, young and beautiful as a spring morning, her long hair has escaped from its confinement and stirs up from the blackened coverings of the bedstead. She has been restless in her sleep, for the clothing of the bed is in much confusion. One arm is over her head, the other hangs nearly off the side of the bed, near to which she lies. A neck and bosom that would have formed a study for the rarest sculptor that ever providence gave genius to, were half disclosed. She moans slightly in her sleep, and once or twice the lips moved as if in a prayer. At least one might judge so, for the name of him, suffer for all came unfaintly from them. She had endured much fatigue, and the storm does not awaken her. When they can disturb these numbers, it does not possess the power to destroy entirely. The turmoil of the elements wakes the senses, although it cannot entirely break the repose they have lapsed into. Oh, what a world of witchery was in that mouth, slightly parted and exhibiting within the pearly teeth that blistered even in the faint light that came from that bay window. How sweetly the long silken eyelashes lay upon the cheek. Now she moves, and one shoulder is entirely visible, wider, fairer than the spotless clothing of the bed on which she lies, the smooth skin of that fair creature, just building into a womanhood, and that transition state will present to us all the charms of the girl. Almost of the child with the more mature beauty and gentleness of advancing years. Was that lightning? Yes. An awful, vivid, terrifying flash. Then a roaring peal of thunder, as if a thousand mountains were rolling one over the other in the blue vault of heaven. Who sleeps now in that ancient city? No one living soul. The dread township of eternity could not more effectually have annihilated anyone. The hail continues. The wind continues. The poor hour of elements seems at its height. Now she awakens, that beautiful girl on the antique bed. She opens those eyes of celestial blue, and a faint cry of alarm bursts from her lips. At least it is a cry which, 
I made the noise in turmoil without sounds but faint in me. She sits on the bed and presses her hands upon her eyes. Heavens, what a wild torrent of wind and rain and hail. The thunder likewise seems upon, intent upon awakening sufficient echoes to last until the next flash of cork lightning should again produce the white concussion of the air. She murmurs a prayer. A prayer for those she loves best. The names of those dear to her gentle heart come from her lips. She weeps and prays. She thinks then of what devastation the storm must really produce. And to the great God of heaven, she pays for all living things. Out of the flesh, a wild blue, the widening flash of lightning streams across the bay window. For an instant, bringing out every color in it with terrible distinctness. A shriek bursts from the lips of the young girl, and then, with eyes fixed upon the windows, which in another moment is all darkness, and with such an expression towers upon her face as it had never been before. No, she trembled, and the respiration came fear to upon her brow. What? What was it? She gasped. Real or a delusion? Oh God! What was it? A figure tall and gaunt, in the every front of the side to press the window. I saw it. The flash of lightning revealed it to me. It stood the whole length of the window. There was a lull in the wind. The hail was not falling so thickly. Moreover, it now fell what there was of it. Straight and yet a strange, clattering sound came upon the glass of that long window. It could not be a delusion. She is awake, and she hears it. What can produce it? Under facial lighting, other chic? There could be now no delusion. A tall figure is standing on the ledge, immediately outside the long window. It is its fingers' nails upon the glass that produce the sound, so like the hail. Now that the hail has ceased, intense fear paralyzes the limbs of that beautiful girl. That one shriek is all she can utter. Her hands clasped, a face of marble, a heart beating, so widening in her bosom. At each moment, it seems as if it would break its confinement. Eyes standing and fixed upon the window, she waits, froze before her. The pattern clattering of the nails continue. No word is spoken, and now she fancies. She can trace the darker form of that figure against the window. And she can see the long arms moving to and fro, feeling for some mode of entrance. What strange light is that which now gradually creeps up into the air? Red and terrible, brighter and brighter it goes. <laughs> the lightning has set fire to a mill, and the reflection of the rapidly consuming building falls upon that long window. There can be no mistake. The fuse is there, to feeling for an entrance and clattering against the glass with long nails that appear as if the growth of many years have been untouched. She tries to scream again, but a choking sensation comes over her, and she cannot. It is too dreadful. She tries to move. Each limb seems weighed down by tons of lead. She can, but in a hoarse faint whisper, cry, Help! 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 And that one word she repeats like a person in a dream. The glare of the fire continues. It throws off the tall god figure in hideous relief against the moon window. It shows, too, upon one portrait that is in the chamber, and the reporters appear to feel his eyes upon the same thing included. Now the flickering light from the fire makes it look fearfully lifelike. A small pane of glass is broken. And the form from without introduces a long cold hand, which is utterly destitute of flesh. The listening, the fastening is removed, and one half of the window, which opens like folding doors, is soon all wide open upon the hinges. And yet, now she could not scream, she could not move. Help, 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 was all she could say. But oh, that look of terror that I set upon her face. It was dreadful. I looked to haunt the memory for a lifetime. 
I look to be true itself upon the happiest moments enter then to bitterness. A figure turns up around, and the light falls upon the face. It is perfectly white, perfectly bloodless. The eyes look like polished tin. The lips are drawn back. And the principal picture next to the doors of dreadful eyes in the chief. The fearful looking chief projecting like those of some wild animal. You can listen me, glaring white and faint like. It approaches the devil with a strange gliding movement. He clashes together the loneliness that literally appear to hang from the finger ends. No sound comes from out its lips. Is she going mad? That young and beautiful girl exposed to so much terror? She has drawn up all her limbs. She cannot even now say help. The power of articulation is gone, but the power of movement has returned to her. She can draw herself slowly along to the other side of that, from that to art to which the hideous appearance has come. But her eyes are fascinated. The glance of serpent could not have produced a greater effect. For her, the indignant fixed gaze of those awful metallic looking eyes that were bent on her face, crouching down so that the gigantic hair was lost, and the horrible protruding white face was the most prominent object came on the picture. What was it? What did it want there? What made it look so hideous, so like an inhabitant of her, and yet to be on it? Now she has got to be on the verge of the bed, and the figure pauses. It seems as if when it paused, she lost the power to proceed. The clothing of the bed was now clutched in her hand. The phone conscious power. She drew her bed short and thick. Her bosom heaps, and her limbs tremble. Yet she cannot withdraw her life from that marble looking face. He holds her of his glittering eye. The storm has ceased, all is still. The winds are hushed. The church clock proclaims the hour of noon. A hissing sound comes from the breath of the hideous being, and he raises his long, cold arm. The lips move. He advances. The girl places one small foot on the bed on the floor. Chosen counsel is dragging the clothing of her. The door of the room is in her that direction. Can she wait? Has she power to walk? Can she withdraw her eyes from the face of the intruder and so break the hideous turn? God of heaven, is it real or some dream so like that as to nearly overturn the judgment forever? The figure has paused again, and half on the bed and half off the head, that young girl lies trembling. Her long hair streams across the entire width of the bed. And she has slowly moved along. She has left it streaming across the pillow. The pause lasted about a minute. Oh, what an age of agony. <laughs> that minute was indeed enough for madness to do its full work in. With a sudden rush that could not be foreseen, with a strange howling cry that was enough to make terror in every breast, the figure of seized the long. Dresses of her hair, a shining gain on his bony hair to have her to the bed. Then she screamed, having granted her then power to scream. Shriek followed shriek in rapid succession. The bad clothes fell in a heap by the side of the bed. She was dragged by her long silken hair and pitched on to it again. Her beautifully rounded wings quivered the agony of her soul. The glassy, horrible eyes of the figure ran over that angelic form in hideous such fashion, horrible preparation. He dragged her head to the bed's edge. He forces the bag by the long hair, still twined in his grasp. With a flange, he seizes her neck and his swing like teeth. A gush of blood in a hideous sucking eyes falls. The girl has swooned and the vampire is at his hideous repast. <laughs>